much. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay, so um, we're now moving on to our next section and uh, you will see that we have uh, Carlos Miguel who is joining us again here um, and Carlos is going to kick off the session that's focusing on wine and food provisioning. Um, he's going to be wearing another hat, a sort of virtual chef's hat for this session um, so let me tell you about his, his role within the, uh, the provisioning side of the industry. So Carlos has been working with um, SAS, YSS. You say that makes it easier. SASIS makes it easier. Okay, yeah, I'll say that. <laughs> uh, since 2015, um, the company is a full concierge service agency serving Chile, Argentina, Peru and Uruguay, with the main emphasis being Patagonia and Antarctica, uh, providing all logistical support for super yachts. Carlos worked as an aficionado guest chef cooking Chilean dishes for a yacht cruise in Patagonia. And he's also a qualified WSET wine educator, organising wine tours and education for guests and crews. During his free time, he enjoys cooking for his family and friends, um, playing tennis, and his hobby includes conventional and drone photography. So Carlos, um, I know you've got some panelists here with you. I'm going to pass over to you for you to introduce everybody and uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Lorna, and it's a pleasure to be back now wearing a little bit of a different hat. And um, uh, I would like to introduce to you and let me see if technology will be on our side this time and so we're not going to have several presenters so it's going to be a little bit easier um we ha we're going to be talking about uh provisioning in remote areas and uh, we have chosen two remote areas uh, one of them in the mediterranean which is more familiar to a lot of people that are in the audience which is malta which is actually quite remote within the mediterranean and then of course antarctica uh, which is very close to what we do in Etsasis. And uh, along in the audience is also Tomas Miranda, our CEO and COO. Um, so the panelists that we have today are Andrew as a party uh, from uh, number 12, um, Fine Wines and Provisions. We have uh, Greg Mikusinski from Provide and Supply. And then we have two chefs to give us the view from the onboard, from the yacht side. They're both uh, chefs uh, on rotation, uh, on legend, that visits uh, several remote locations. On one side, we have Robin at Sjöström, and we have Andrew McCartney. Both have been to our area down south. So today we're going to concentrate on talking a little bit about provisioning in, in the remote areas. Um, just to give you an idea of what it means, uh, how do you have to plan for provisioning? Uh, I just did a very brief calculation. And if you're going to have a 10 day Antarctica charter on a yacht like Legend, which is about 77 meters long, uh, traditionally it can carry up to 26 guests and crew is uh, 19 plus plus because you usually need to have expedition leaders, Antarctic uh, um, uh, guides, you need to have a helicopter uh, pilots, submarine pilots and so on. So your crew can easily uh, be 25 up to, I know legend has had up to 60 people. So basically you have to plan over a 10 day charter for about 1,500 meals. That gives you a little bit the the, the, the range of, of complexity that it means to do provisioning in these uh, more remote areas. And that's where companies like Greg's and Andrew's come in. And uh, how do you um, uh, help with that? It's often overlooked and not thought. It's taken for granted by, by guests that the food's going to be there. It's going to be on your table and it's going to look better than in any restaurant 
finest restaurant in New York or, 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 or Paris or anywhere in the world. And so in the wine industry, there's a saying that's a long way from grape to glass. And uh, here we also, in the case of uh, foods, it's a long way from farm to table. And how do you make it happen? There's two very important steps here. First of all, is the, is the provisioning of it and then is the preparation of it. So we have the right people on the panel today to discuss that. So some, some of the challenges of yacht provisioning, and uh, one of them is if you compare it to a restaurant, to a traditional restaurant, a yacht is, is, is moving, constantly moving. So there are certain windows where you can do provisioning. Uh, often the yachts will be in locations that they've been to for the first time. So how do you deal with uh, all for a first time. Um, in many places that they go, especially if it's remote places, you cannot just get off board and the chef can go in and do the shopping. Uh, there's language barriers, there's uh, local foods and, and many other things. Um, then the next question is, once I have my provisions, how do I store them? Uh, where do I store them? Of course, large yachts uh, have, and the expedition yachts that are being built nowadays um, I, uh, do have those uh, facilities to store more food, but still, if you have to think of 1,500 plus meals just for 10 days, it is a challenge. So it requires a lot of, of planning. Um, the food needs to be stored safely and properly, uh, first of all, because you can encounter rough seas, so you cannot just leave boxes and things anywhere. And then there's like all the cold storage. So uh, non-perishable foods also play a, a, a very important role. And uh, most of all, food makes people happy. So that's also the challenge for the chefs. Uh, the provisions have to be of good quality, but then the chefs also need to be able to prepare the foods um, in, in the proper way that guests expect. Otherwise, a, a charter can just turn to disaster if it's a simple thing that we take for granted, like the food doesn't work. Um, also, it's uh, important that you plan separately for guests and crews, usually the the, the type of foods that are served and, and, and uh, the times that are served are different. And uh, as I said, you have often different countries, different cultures, different foods. Some foods you cannot bring in to certain countries and you have a whole ton of limitations. So that's important also to work with the local knowledge, the local agents to bring in those foods or to, lo uh, to source locally. Um, and last of all, another thing that needs to be thought of is uh, disposal, not just disposal of, of leftovers, but disposal of packaging. And that's where a little bit what we talked earlier, or um, uh, a gentleman, Clive Jackson, talked about sustainability uh, for us in Patagonia and Antarctica is very important sustainability. And to just to give you an example, in Patagonia, in Chile, plastic bags are, not, are prohibited now for supermarkets. So. Um, and in Antarctica, the Antarctic Treaty regulates things even a lot more. So that's another thing that needs to be taken into consideration when you do the provisioning is how it's packaged and how do you dispose of the packaging. Uh, here's a quick example of what you can do uh, as a crew with uh, local, um, uh, or as uh, Greg calls it, metro provisioning. Uh, this is an example of a yacht provisioning in Valparaiso in Chile. And at the bottom you see uh, provisions arriving on, on a small jet plane in Antarctica. Uh, so in this case, the foods come sometimes from Europe. They fly on a big plane, then they fly on a domestic flight within Chile, then they get transferred to the Antarctica flight. So another very important thing is how do you maintain the cold chain and how do you time things with customs, with arrivals, uh, departures, size of packaging, etc. So it throws quite a few challenges. Here we have some of the views, uh, uh, pictures that uh, Andrew sent me from his provisioning so, uh, company. So the first question that I would like to pose to, to Andrew is, um, and nowadays, the age of the internet and people being able to buy things over the internet and being delivered to the yacht, which also has become an issue in COVID times. Um, what is the advantage for a yacht to be working with a provisioner versus for the crew to be doing their own provisioning 
if you are in a non-remote location, because if you're in a remote location, you basically have no choice. So Andrew, if you could help me with that question and then I'll turn it also on to Greg to give me his aspect. Thank you, Carlos. First of all, thanks for, for having me um, as one of the panelists over here. So with regards to Malta, it is somewhat a remote location. So we actually defined it on this panel as, as a remote location because it's an island, not because it's Antarctica or, or, or Chile, which I think are a little bit more remote. So we're only just, just an hour or two away from, from Sicily by boat. So it's actually not so remote. However, it is an island and, and being an island, we do need to take that into consideration, meaning that anything that is imported to Malta, so unless it is grown in Malta or farmed in Malta, it needs to be imported in. And that is why we would somewhat consider Malta a remote location. Now, going back to your question, Carlos, with regards to COVID and the, the effects of COVID, at the end of the day, the, the owner and I think more so the captain needs to look after their crew. The crew is at risk, whether there's the owner or whether it's a charter boat. The crew is extremely high risk that the whole season is uh, at the detriment of, of, of COVID. So if one of, one of the crew, and this is something that I've been hearing from a lot of captains and chefs, they've been coming up to me saying, listen, we have a problem. We cannot, either we cannot get off the boat because we've just arrived uh, and we're in quarantine, or because we're going out on charter in a week's time, or the boss is coming over in two weeks' time, and the last thing we want is somebody to get sick with COVID. Um, and that is where the provisioner comes in. As soon as COVID hit in Malta back in February, March, um, it took us around a week or two, I think, to, to reevaluate the situation, see what was happening, and then actually put in certain um, certain standard operating procedures for us to deliver to the to the client to to reduce the risk. Um, as I, I don't know if you can see from one of the images that the bottom right. So we even basically um, we, we clean our vans and sanitize them, you know, weekly, and more so if we've got you know more deliveries uh, within the week, and that is extremely important, not just for our clients, but also for ourselves as well. So even our team had to split and separate in two different teams, because if one of us was at the market or with a supplier and got sick, that means then the rest of the team is, is at risk and needs to go into quarantine. So we split our team into two so that we can carry on supplying our clients, even if one of the teams uh, unfortunately gets, uh, gets ill. So, you know, we had to take a lot of huge decisions and steps as soon as COVID hit, to be honest. Um, thank God so far, we've, we've been lucky that we, we haven't been knocked ourselves. Mm -hmm. But uh, admittedly, a lot of our clients, even those that used to enjoy going to the supermarket just for you know, a few um, you know, bits and bobs, if I may say so, have now even been asking us, you know, can you just get you know, these small items for us? And can you do a little bit more so that we don't leave the yacht. So at the end of the day, I mean, we consider ourselves the N plus one crew. We are the, if there are 10 crew, we are the 11th crew member. And, and that is what our job is to basically be part of the crew so that the rest of the crew can, can continue doing the work that they're, that they're supposed to do basically. Okay. And uh, Greg, from your perspective, uh, you supply uh, yachts in remote locations, but also in the med. Um, where do you see for the yachts uh, the advantage of working with someone like you? Obviously, remote locations is almost there's no other choice uh, except for Stokely, which we also do, so we work together. Uh, but in, in like the Med, uh, where's the advantage in non-COVID times? Let's leave COVID out. <laughs> uh, where's the advantage for them to work with a company like yours? You're muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you for having me as well. Uh, to build on, on uh, what Andrew has said, now more than ever, crews relying on us as they've been forced to quarantine on boats. Um, they've been asked to minimize contact with the general public. Uh, it seems that for food especially, which is what's consumed, the less hands that touch it, the less people that it pass through, 
the better for the boat. So if they could get something locally opposed to being shipped, obviously it's, it's the best way to go. Uh, in our case, we've seen a, a real big uh, increase in demand from shipyards where there's a lot of crew that's not only having to work on board and, and contain to the boat, but there's a lot of subcontractors that are coming in that, that the crew chef has to feed. So it's, it's, in COVID it's helped us in some degree that we've had to do more for the crew and Robin and Andrew, you probably both like to get off the boat every now and then and, and go just to get off, off board. It's a little bit of a break, <laughs> but unfortunately we've seen chefs not be able to leave and rely on us more and more. Um, but all things aside, and under, under most circumstances where there's a large crew and there's high demands, it's almost impossible for one chef, two chefs, two chefs and two other crew to go in and do a top up for two weeks at a store and get the quantities they want and the packaging that they need for larger vessels. It's, it's, even if they could, it's the resources that you're taking off the boat from the crew members, having people leave their posts, having to rent the car, multiple trolleys at the store, payment is an issue too in many cases. So provisioners, although sometimes aren't necessarily seen as, as an advantage locally when you're somewhere where you could shop, I think we do provide a service that, that the chefs need in order to make their lives easier and also to put less of a burden on the boat as well. All right. Thank you, Greg. That's also very insightful information. And now to uh, turn to Robin and to Andrew. Um, when you go on a, on a, to a remote location, uh, whether it's uh, Norway, whether it's uh, the Arctic, Antarctica, even Patagonia, uh, how far in advance do you have to start planning, uh, thinking about foods, thinking obviously if you are a charter yacht, you get guests with different uh, likes, uh, maybe food allergies, uh, sometimes you have to supply uh, or, or, or prepare foods that are kosher or uh, halal or um, organic, sustainable, and so on. Um, how, how much planning does go into uh, this more remote type of provisioning? Uh, well, are you going to start, Andre, or should I? Yeah. Robin, if you can go first. Yeah, uh, I mean... Uh, I mean, as soon as better, obviously, as, as soon as we get the, the preferences from, from the guests, we can start planning our provisioning according to that. And I mean, uh, normally we have to kind of give, give Greg our ordering list minimum, let's say two weeks in advance. So he get a chance as well to source down all the other products which we will need to have for that specific charter uh, and it comes to all the dietary requirements and the special products whether it's kosher or halal whatever it can be so uh, plus we need at least a week to get the provision from Europe as well down to Antarctica yeah. so yeah it, it's, a, it's, it's a lot of planning but so far I've been uh, very successful uh, previous season so that, that's great. Andrew, your, your perspective? Well, yeah, my take is that our season began in Patagonia in early November uh, last year, um, but we started planning for it in Barcelona in, um, in the beginning of September. So, you know, in a, a sunny, warm, relatively uh, well, very busy place back then, actually. I'm sure it's changed a bit now. And you have to think ahead six to eight months in order to um, satisfy the guests, the crew, and also to have the stores on board that um, cut down on the weight and the volume of stores you'll be flying in for, um, for your guests and for your crew. So it's, yeah, we, me and Robin had some, uh, we had some late nights and we had some uh, anguished emails to Greg, um, but we pulled it off and uh, we <laughs> learned a lot from this. We definitely came back uh, more, um, certainly stronger, more resilient chefs for it. And uh, it was a great experience. And one of the cool things that you do actually on Legend is you grow your own uh, hydroponics on board, which I found quite amazing. Uh, so that's uh, very interesting. I mean, you have to have quite a garden there <laughs> to be able to supply for so many 
uh, guests and crew. I assume you use it mostly for guests, maybe for garnishing purposes. Exactly, yeah. Just, just microgreens and, and baby lettuces, etc. We actually got the idea in Barcelona because um, uh, they relaxed the cannabis laws there recently. And so there's a number of grow shops have sprung up around the city. So we got in touch with Juan and he um, agreed to modify his existing setup for us to grow, um, to grow lettuces and herbs. And we had about three square, two and a half square meters uh, spread over two levels of um, non-soil growing medium, hydroponically irrigated with fertilizer. And we ran on a sort of an eight day cycle. So we could always harvest fresh herbs and greens to, to, um, to, to garnish guest dishes and any leftovers would go to crew. But yeah, it was, uh, it was an extra couple of, uh, an extra few hours in our, in our work week, but it made, a, it made a big difference. And especially in Antarctica, when you have a two or three day mm -hmm window for uh for fragile items coming from europe it, um it certainly filled the gaps in, in stuff we, we weren't we weren't uh confident that would arrive in good condition yeah that's quite amazing here we see some of the creations that that robin makes on board and some of the work that uh andrew makes i mean it's uh, just uh, amazing when you have to uh, prepare foods for so many people maybe you don't even get to see what the guests see <laughs> you spend a lot of time in the kitchen and preparing things and so it's, uh, it's really a, a, a job that I think people, that is very much behind the scenes that people don't, don't see how much work goes into it and how much preparation goes into it. And especially again, if you're in, in, in remote locations. So now another question back to, uh, to, to Greg and, and, and Andrew is, uh, you know, most of the food uh, that uh, you, you need to have some fresh f uh, foods on board, especially fruits and vegetables, and how do you deal with uh, seasonality or availability of uh, foods? Because, for example, if you're going to ship uh, strawberries, as we see here, you know, there are so many other things that need to be shipped. Uh, how do you deal with the seasonality of the fruit? Are all fruits available year round or how do you work that out? Uh, Greg, if you can go first. Yeah, sure. From our end, so we source in Runges, Paris, as well as in Rotterdam. And every day there's flights coming in from all over the world where something is in season. Um, unfortunately, this time, this time with COVID, it, it severely affected the price of shipping. And thus, a lot of chefs say, how, how come this is now four times what it was last year? But that's unfortunate, unfortunately the consequence of wanting something that it's out of season in one part of the world, but you have to fly in from somewhere else and you have such a short window of opportunity to enjoy it while it's fresh. So we've, we've spent quite a while and several years now finding vendors all over the world, but more importantly, setting up really reliable channels of logistics because there's a lot of romance in gastronomy, but at the end of the day, we are a logistics business. We have to make sure that things come from all over, stay intact, stay in a cold chain, and get to the plate through the chefs exactly how they need them to be. So uh, it's, I'm happy to see them growing the microgreens on Legend because it's one of those items that if it does take a week to ship and it's two, three days after harvest before it gets up in the air, hits a couple of trucks and then has to get offloaded onto a boat, like Andrew said, I mean, the odds of it lasting more than three or four days are or at best, highly unlikely. Yeah. Andrew, in your case in Malta, of course, in the Mediterranean, you have uh, more availability from different areas surrounding Malta, but obviously all of this needs to be shipped into Malta. So I guess uh, you also have that uh, uh, problem every now and then, or, or am I mistaken? Yes, we do. Um, I think it was Robin mentioning before. I mean, at the end of the day, you get a, a requisition list from the boss so he's he or she is the person that decides what they want and unfortunately it's not always the chef that has to make that decision so if they want for example only only this morning one of the chefs requested napa valley cabbages now unfortunately in malta we do not find <laughs> napa valley cabbages so you know we have to source that for and we do have sources for them so similar to greg Yes, and I would reiterate this. I mean, it, it does sound very cool being a provisioner for super yachts and, and, and very, very bling, but we are a logistics company. So at the end, of the day, we need to, <laughs> that's our job it, is to get the, the, the right produce to you. However, maybe different to, to Greg, 
we also like to suggest the some of the local produce and this is where and then there's it's really important for the the provisioner and the chef to really communicate on what needs to be brought in and what doesn't need to be brought in so there are a lot of very often we find misconceptions which for example the 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 microgreens we've got a little farmer just around the corner from 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 the office who's got an amazing microgreen uh, farm and and fantastic that strangely enough i think it was about six seven years ago we used to have to import them from holland and as, as greg mentioned before you know you've got three days to, to actually get them over and then another day till you unload them from from the, the the freight and then you know you put them on the boat and they're already four or five days old so you know we've managed to come up with alternatives and then there are other other foods such as for example you know tomatoes prawns tuna people are under the impression that uh, i want to have the for example spanish prawns which may i add are fantastic yes <laughs> but there is an alternative in malta just as good so that is where then the the us being the n plus one crew i mentioned before comes in obviously then there are other items in Malta, you know, since we're speaking about Malta, for example, the local beef isn't anything in particular. So we need to have, you know, sources, foreign sources for these and, and you know, ha get them to come in really fast. Same with oysters. We don't grow our own oysters here. So, you know, we'd need at least two or three days in advance to, to, to get the oysters in. And, you know, our, our, at the end of the day, we are as, as strong as our weakest link. So if our suppliers don't come through, then we don't come through. And, and as Greg was saying before, it's all about strategic partners, uh, be it locally or, or, or overseas. Yeah. So that's, no, that's, that's very true. And, you know, we also uh, experience that. Um, one of the things that we suggest to, to chefs or to, to yacht, yacht owners and yacht managers is uh, if they have, if it's a larger expedition, is for them to have the chefs fly, for example, to Chile and see what can be sourced locally. Uh, you too, Greg and Andrew might not like that idea, <laughs> uh, but you know, it's, um, it is, uh, and I'm just joking, by the way, um, I this, agree with you, actually. It's, it's better to do it locally if you can, because the weight, I mean, we have weight restrictions now in, in Patagonia at, to Antarctica, which Robin and I have, have spent a lot of late nights over figuring out what we will ship and what we won't. Exactly. And that's, that's where you can work with, uh, you know, with your local agents who have the local knowledge. Also, the whole logistics uh, is very complex because, uh, you know, if uh, some, sometimes uh, provisioners that don't have the experience have tried to send things by FedEx and, and because they think it's going to get there faster. But in the end, the, 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 the provisions arrive in Santiago and they have to go through customs. So you have to time it correctly if for them not to arrive on a Friday or a Saturday. And FedEx doesn't have cold storage, so then it gets transferred to a, a Chilean courier. So that's where the advice and us working together as a team with the chefs, with the provisioners, and us as agents is, is very important for the success of any expedition. And uh, we've had you know, some things that always surprise us some chefs <laughs> sometimes is that in Chile you cannot find lemongrass, for example. Or on the other hand, uh, from a customs fresh point milk. of view. No fresh milk. <laughs> <laughs> on another point, you know, you cannot bring in honey into Chile. Chile has great honeys. And that's the other thing is, you know, is to encourage by bringing chefs beforehand mm -hmm. for them to experience the local foods. And maybe they can also then prepare some of the local dishes for the guests, for the owners. Uh, and, and along with the wines, I mean, that's one of the things we also try to promote, Chile being a wine producing country, is Chile has some amazing wines, but often people prefer to go with what they know, and uh, they ask us to, to, to bring, to buy French and California wines for them, um, and there's so, so much more out there to experience. So um, it, is, it is a very uh, fun uh, world to work in and you know it's, it's especially a little bit challenged now by uh, this whole COVID thing and, and more restrictions and also as I was mentioning earlier the other restriction that we're seeing uh, which is a good thing actually uh, but it creates another logistical issue is the packaging and especially when you're in Antarctica you know the prohibition of, of styrofoam packaging and things like that so uh, 
that's another thing that needs to be thought about, the logistics. And uh, here, just to give you an example, I don't want to, uh, you know, go on a, a lot with these pictures, uh, but this is basically how things get shipped. Uh, you have to check temperatures. And then, for example, if you look at these beautiful pallets, it looks packaged great. But when, once they arrive in Chile, they, not, they don't fit into domestic flight because we don't have seven triple sevens flying domestically. So then these pallets need to be taken apart and that's not allowed by customs. So <laughs> the logistics start at the beginning, as Andrew was saying, in Barcelona, you have to start planning for your trip uh, down south. And I'm sure it's like that in different countries. And Chile in general is still quite relaxed about uh, the norms and, and, um, and it is also uh, very quick with customs. So other countries are a little bit more 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 difficult to deal with. Um, anyways, uh, I want to uh, ask uh, Andrew and uh, Robin another question, and is um, what what type of foods are the ones that give you the most problems when guests uh, request them? Uh, how do you solve uh, special requests when you're in such remote locations? Yeah, uh, Robin, if you can maybe go with that. Well, uh, I mean, uh, we had charters where we, we had kosher guests on, and I mean, we we have to speak to Greg, our supplier, get the the right uh, equipment for it first of all, and we need to get the the right food for it as well. And I mean, Greg's been very helpful with us to get our souls down all that. And I mean, every kind of requirements we have on board when it comes to guests, I mean, we, of course, we do our best every day to, to, to make, make them happy and, and kind of satisfy whatever they, the, the needs. And I think that's the, the communication between the, the supplier and, and, us the chefs and make it happen and uh, <clears throat> end of the day i mean uh, we try to make everything from scratch on board that's both me and andrew's phil philosophy so instead of bringing in fruits and yeast for example we making every single pastry from scratch on board which is way better and i mean instead of flying 20 kilos of uh, pan de chocolat or croissants across the Atlantic. So, and it comes down also to the, uh, the microgreens growing. Uh, every, we, we're making our own chocolates on board. We're uh, making our kombucha on board. Andre's top on all pickling and, and fermentation vegetables. So, I mean, we, then that's how we have to work when we are in such remote area. Mm -hmm. So what do you say, Andrew? Yeah, exactly. We, um, we set out to um, be as self-sufficient as possible and we picked our team and trained them accordingly. Um, a big point of this, the level of service we offer, we also dealt directly with the clients themselves, um, where, even with individual family groups within one trip. So we, um, dug into their preferences, we dug into what gluten-free actually meant to them, we dug into how actual kosher they were, and we spoke to them personally on two or three occasions, and we had, we had a, a, a chain of emails and, and, and asks and, and, and responses from them. So we could tailor our stores precisely to that trip and um, fly in as little as possible. So we had, um, the, the ship was loaded at the end of October, and then we lasted until the end of mid-March with um, frozen meats and fishes for the guests and uh, all our stock. Etc. and dry stores. It was a it was a big undertaking. It was the first time me and Robin had been so isolated for such a long time. Uh, <laughs> it came off greatly thanks to our thanks as usual to our provisioners, whether it's Greg or or any other provisioner that's um, experienced with providing yachts with uh, excellent service. Um, it makes a difference where you can just email them and say, uh, Greg, sorry to do this to you, but uh, <laughs> insert a problematic <laughs> issue here. Yeah, I don't know if it it happened uh, to us with you, Greg, that. Uh, a yacht in Patagonia, Antarctica, requested strawberries from Holland. And uh, then when they arrived, uh, they, they, you did ship them, or someone did ship them from, from Europe. And they arrived in, in Chile, and the chef called us, or called Tomas, and told me, hey, the strawberries I got, 
I open it and it says produce of Chile. <laughs> I don't think that was us because we have the greenhouses here that we usually send from. But yeah. So I mean, funny I things like that long. <laughs> I had other I had other surprises with you guys though where you know we learned in the last couple of years where we have to do the transfer at night and not during the day because of the temperature just having the pallets sit on the tarmac even as you saw them covered all the heat comes up from the bottom yeah up the entire load then it goes into cold storage and you have the reverse effect of basically keeping everything that should have been refrigerated now at a warm temperature so we we, we had some loss and berries were always the things that go first, as Robin probably remembers. Made a lot of smoothies with the bad berries, I'm sure. Yeah, we can't grow those yet, unfortunately. We're working on it. And then, then the yeah. question is, who's at fault? You know, if something doesn't arrive in, uh, in proper condition. A uh, question quickly for you, Andrew and, and Robin, uh, of your experience that you've had now with uh, provisioning in, in, in Antarctica, which for you has been the, probably the most, uh, look, how, what percentage of the food that you received would you say was in, in pristine uh, or, or uh, let's turn around, how much of the food was in maybe not such an acceptable condition? And what can you do as chefs to beautify it? <laughs> Andrew? I mean, it comes down to the, the, the most sensitive items, like the berries, obviously. Uh, especially when uh, the berries get unloaded to other, the second second flight again, I mean, the, those boxes have been handled in very poor conditions, uh, which the, 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 the people who's doing it is not aware of. There are X amounts of cases of uh, fresh strawberries and blueberries and raspberries. Uh, I mean, uh, so, I mean, the berries always takes a big hit. Um, some of the fruits as well, but in general, when it comes to all, all the dairies, vegetables, uh, melons. I mean, they are, in my opinion, very in a very good condition. Uh, trying to avoid to to get uh, meat and seafood because that, that's what, like Andrew said before. We planning already that uh, five six months ahead, uh, especially in Barcelona. So we got all that on board already before we left mm. Europe. Mm, yeah. Well, that's, uh, and, and Andrew, you were telling me the other day when you uh, receive things, sometimes they're not in such uh, great conditions, but you have means and ways to make food look good again. <laughs> it, oh, yeah, um, we, went with, we had a team of four chefs, uh, all quite very experienced at all levels of cooking. So we, um, we, have, our, uh, we have our ways. I won't, um, I won't spoil the, uh, the, the surprise for people who are watching. Uh, or the secret. Um, uh, yeah, don't give away the I'm secret. Not, yeah, <laughs> really uh, lend itself to uh, fruit salads and um, kind of light, light yeah. summery dishes anyway. I mean, you, you're wandering around in minus 20, there's ice on the deck, there can be blizzards and snowstorms, etc. The food has yeah. to be quite robust. And, so. and there's another challenge when you are in remote locations is, for example, especially in, in Antarctica, is that you can actually be stranded for two or three extra days in Antarctica, because uh, yeah. the window. So you need to plan for extra days. And we had a yacht where the chef ended up serving uh, peanut butter sandwiches to the guests and the guests uh, came back and said that these are actually the yummiest peanut butter sandwiches we've ever had in our life. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, there's some, some really cool anecdotes that I think we can go on for a couple of, uh, you know, more minutes or hours here talking and telling, you know, things that have happened to us and also Andrew from his perspective, you know, in, 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 in the Mediterranean. But I think, uh, Lauren, I see you coming on. So that means that our time is up. The time is up. Yes. So thank you very much indeed, Carlos, uh, Greg, and Robin, Andrew and Andrew. And that was very interesting. And I, I think you've kind of whetted our appetite now for, for what is to follow because we've been talking all about food and wine. And now um, Andrew Azapardi is going to stay with us to host our, our next uh, session which is an actual wine tasting a virtual wine tasting um, never before seen on keynote screens so we're we're delighted that he's joining us on this pioneering venture so um, guys um, apart from Andrew if you want to go back into the audience and we will at least I will <laughs> yeah absolutely oh.
Yes. Thank you. Let me just quickly say thank you to, to Andrew, Greg, uh, Andrew as well, and Robin for taking part today, and Lorna and uh, Allison again, thank you for having us. Uh, an interesting subject. I hope we were able to keep the audience, uh, you know, uh, learning new things and also a little bit entertained with our little stories. So thank you again for Absolutely. having me. Two segments. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Carlos. Thank you, everybody.